And so our next storyteller, pulling the thread from Terry and the Court of Ideas and Carnegie Mellon University, um, is Vivian Lofness. Um, Longtime professor at Carnegie Mellon University, internationally renowned uh, building performance, um, and GBA board member. Welcome to the stage. So I wish we had a campfire. Wouldn't that be perfect for storytelling? Um, how did I get here? Uh, well, it's a sort of a long story. Uh, like most of you in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to study. I loved math, I loved chemistry, I loved art, and so I went off to college and I studied chemistry and math and architecture, and I fell in love with architecture. And I realized as I fell in love with architecture that less than 1% of the practicing architects were women. I thought, uh-oh, this is not gonna be easy. So I took every math course, every engineering course, every technology course, thinking I better be on top of all the disciplines so that I could sit in a room of men and hold my own. And, and I did, in fact, sit in many, many rooms filled with men, and I'm sure they thought I was there to take notes until they realized that I wanted to actually contribute to the conversation. I did my bachelor's and my master's at MIT, and when you do your master's in architecture, you have to write a thesis. So I had made a decision with two amazing advisors, Ed Allen and uh, Kevin Lynch, to write a master's thesis on natural forces in the craft of building. I wanted to become a sight whisperer. That's like a horse whisperer, but it was someone who fell in love with sights, with the trees and the topography and the water. Uh, and the sun and the wind and the climate of that particular location. And I thought if we could actually let the site whisper to us, our architecture would be brilliant. So I, I wrote this thesis and I was working feverishly on it. And when you do a master's thesis, even today, you have to defend it publicly in front of a large audience. But I was having trouble getting a time slot on the calendar of my advisors. And so I kept thinking, well, maybe if I do it at dinner time and I offer dinner, they'll come. And lo and behold, that was going to work. So I scheduled this, and my parents, who had come to my bachelor's graduation uh, at MIT, I had, uh, we had talked about coming again for my master's graduation, and thought, well, you know, it's pretty much the same place, the same ceremony. Why don't you come to my master's thesis presentation? Because that would be a defense, would be a whole different experience. So my parents said, sure, I can do this. We'll come up. So meanwhile, I told my mother that I was going to offer dinner in addition to my master's thesis being on the wall. So this was 150 pages of handwritten, hand-drawn sight whispering that I was putting up on the wall. And she kept saying, well, what are you serving for dinner? I said, look, I'm just trying to get the 150 pages written so I can put it up on the wall. I have no idea what I'm serving for dinner. And this would go on week after week. Every week when you talk to mom, she'd say, well, what are you going to serve them to eat? I said, I am really, I'm only about halfway through. I can't figure out what I'm serving to eat. So about a month before my final defense, we had this conversation all over again. And my mother said, look, this is getting ridiculous. You only have a month between now. Do you want me to serve dinner? And I said, oh, what a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of this? And lo and behold, she had already planned the whole menu. She planned it two months before. She was going to make boeuf bourguignon and noodles and pate. And, you know, this is my mother was a gourmet chef, so this was a, a no-brainer. So they, my father and mother drove up from Washington, D.C. in a long station wagon filled with pots of things to serve what I thought was going to be about 15 people, including, of course, my thesis advisors who had to approve this thesis. And she arrives in, in Boston. I lived in Harvard Square with uh, two roommates who were great. And they, we, uh, they were going to help my mother cook while I was still feverishly working on the last 10 pages or 15 pages of my thesis so I could get it up on the wall and actually pass uh, with, with a degree in architecture. And uh, my uh, roommate was working with my mother at home. I was feverishly working at the university. And the landlord comes upstairs to our apartment and knocks on the door. It's an Italian landlord who ran a structural engineering firm downstairs. And he, uh, he stands at the door with my roommate, and then he starts to say, well, uh, Sue, I just wanted to tell you your rent is not due till next week. And she goes, uh, yeah, I mean, we know we always pay the rent on time, and it's not next week, so why are you here? And he goes, well, I just, I just wanted to tell you that it's not due till next week. She says, I have no clue why you're here. She says, he says... You know, you girls have lived up here for a year, and I have never smelled anything this good come out of this apartment. What's happening here? And he says, oh, 
oh, now I know why you came up to collect the rent. You just want to have some food. So, of course, he was the first taster of this meal, which then had to be trundled down from Harvard Square down to MIT and brought up three flights of stairs to this long, remote uh, corridor to where I was pinning up my 150 pages of my master's thesis. And the smells were so pervasive that we had over 60 people managed to find this thesis defense. Uh, it was a great success. I did graduate. And all I can say is that what, you, family matters hugely in the success of individuals uh, in, in any field, and certainly in architecture. So moving forward, I became totally fascinated with climate and microclimate. And I still, to this day, use this as the centerpiece of my teaching. For some people in this room, they know that. Um, I focused, when I was at the AIA Research Corporation, on climate and its impact on design and was able to write a book called Regional Guidelines for Passive Energy Conserving Homes, where we talked about the brilliance of location, of climates that are unique and different, uh, of being in the shade uh, and uh, looking at places that have brilliant sunlight, uh, places that have brilliant natural ventilation, and the difference between uh, airports like this and airports that are designed to embrace climate are massive, right? So there's no question in my mind that the beauty of place is about microclimate and, and region. Which brings me to the intelligent workplace. Now, I can't talk about Carnegie Mellon and the intelligent workplace without talking about Volker Hartkopf, who's sitting here in the front row, who many of you know, who brought me to Pittsburgh, and who's one of those very, very unique men who celebrate the success of his wife, and in fact, of every woman that he works with. So he's really a champion of women and women's success, which is really brilliant. And all of you women who are not married, I hope you find a husband like this. <laughs> So moving from site whisperer to climate whisperer to place whisperer, the intelligent workplace, we get phone calls all the time from people who say, I'm calling from the stupid workplace. What's so special about the intelligent workplace? I said, well, the intelligent workplace has long views out over the campus where life moves around continuously. It has doors that open so you can hear the children playing down below. It has sunlight streaming in in the morning and sunlight streaming in the afternoon. It celebrates natural ventilation with windows that you can open, not worrying about whether the rain is going to come in. It's a brilliant place, and it's a wonderful place to live and work. And all I can say to those of you in the room who still work in the stupid workplace, I want to be your whisperer and see if I can help you get into an intelligent workplace. Thank you. Reactions. Who works in the stupid workplace? <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest about it. What did you say, Chris? Whisper to me. Whisper to me. Uh-oh, Volker, you better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Vivian doesn't know this, but um, when I uh, defended my PhD thesis, uh, we did lunch, and my husband, who was trained as a chef, made lunch. <laughs> it was a packed room. <laughs> yeah, trailblazer, yeah. Vivian's definitely a trailblazer. Anyone else? OK, what's well, a place that you guys love? The 7400 block of Tioga Street, because of the people. It's very specific, very specific. I love Pittsburgh because I grew up in the city and have a sentimental attachment to many spots I knew here when I was younger. And then also to new spots I only discovered later in life when I had expanded my range to larger circles in the city. I love nature. That means on my farm, walking in the woods, near water, it makes me feel active. This is the first one about nature <laughs> that I've had. <laughs> it, you know, a lot of times at GBA we think about the built environment and the vertical built environment. Um, I'm an engineer, so I know a lot about the horizontal infrastructure too that we all take for granted. But nature, you know, that's one of the reasons that we all do what we do.